Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast, where we talk with top entrepreneurs and CEOs about creating valuable companies through creative transactions. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, welcome. This is Todd Tasky. I am your host of the Second Bite Podcast, where I get a wonderful opportunity to talk to CEOs and entrepreneurs uh, about building and eventually selling very valuable companies. And, you know, people really seem to love this podcast, John, because we get to talk to people that are, are unknown, relatively unknown, but have built seven and eight figure businesses. Um, and whether they've done a transaction and are working towards a second bite or still working on their original company. And there's just a lot to learn from those people. Uh, today, John Fitzpatrick is my guest from Force Marketing. And John, we're super excited to have you today. Thanks for having me. No, I'm excited to be here. Hey, and, and just before we get started, I want to thank the good people at eCohen uh, who are our sponsors. And so eCohen is a full service CPA firm in Rockville, Maryland. Um, they do a full suite of tax and consulting services. They will also help you with your financials so that you look as best as you possibly can when you present to investors or potential acquirers. Uh, Forbes says that they're one of the most referred to uh, accounting firms in the Mid-Atlantic area. They're always on the, um, the best place to work list. So uh, if you want to learn more about the good folks at eCohen, you can go to eCohen.com and you can learn more about them. So with that uh, behind us, John, again, thanks for being on board. Um, to give our listeners a little bit of context, tell me, tell me about you know, the size of Force and who you serve as customers and what you do for them. Sure. I'll give you a little background too behind that. <clears throat> I grew up in the auto industry and uh, my dad uh, ran high volume uh, stores, mostly for Toyota as a brand. I uh, grew up in South Florida, uh, but I got to see through his lens how the auto industry ticked and how it worked and and more importantly, the amount of money spent in advertising and marketing. And so um, we, 16 years ago, we started Force Marketing um, to focus on bringing data and technology to drive better personalization from your local dealer to uh, the consumer. Uh, and then we've worked our way up to working with some of the big manufacturers as well uh, in automotive. We stayed focused in automotive. It's a huge TAM, uh, total addressable market is, is massive. $1.2 trillion industry. Um, and the amount of you know money spent in advertising market, as I mentioned, you know, it's it's upwards of $40 billion between the national, regional, and local level. So um, big opportunity. Um, and uh we've just been um building it um ourselves. Uh really didn't start with much capital, uh, but as we grew um and we just continue to pour every profit that we made back into the business, betting on ourselves, doubling down on ourselves. Um, and today we've got about a hundred employees company-wide, three offices, New York City, a uh, very small office in New York City, all the heavy lifting, the headquarters is out of Atlanta, which is where I am. Uh, and we uh, recently acquired a business uh, out of Houston. So we've got a nice office with about 40 folks in the Houston market. Um, and we're about a $75, 80000000 million revenue business. Um, and um, like I said, uh, only in auto and focused on uh, the digital marketing uh, connectivity um, to the consumer on behalf of the brands and the local dealers. And you said we a couple times. Did you found the business by yourself or you have a partner? So uh, my father was, was very uh, influential. Uh, he and I started the business uh, essentially together, uh, like I said, about 16 years ago. Uh, he had an opportunity coming out of the retail side of auto, and uh, I I was coming out of college, uh, bushy tailed and bright eyed, and and uh, we uh, we started the business. We were off and running. This is back in uh, two thousand five six. Uh, off and running pretty quickly um, through his contact. We were able to really, um, you know, get in a lot of you know pitch conversations, opportunities to grow the business with dealer groups uh, all over the southeast, which then grew all over the country. Um, and then, uh, you know, just hockey stick growth. And then the financial crisis hit uh, and uh, everybody sort of right. Eye. That was 08, 09. Right. Yeah. And then uh, by 2010, 2011, um, I think that just shook up the world so much. Uh, <clears throat> my dad's very much an entrepreneur. He was like, hey, I want to do this and I want to do that. And I was like, 
we just got through a financial crisis. Let's just hang on to this business. I think it could be something really big. And uh, at that point in time, he just wanted to do these other things. So we started a, a buyout process. Um, but today, he, you know, he's still a shareholder and a board member and very influential. I talk to him every day, um, but, but really hasn't been in the business for about 11 or 12 years. Got day it. To day. So yeah. I want to pick up on something. You know, a lot of the, uh, the deal trophies behind me, a lot of the folks we've interviewed for the podcast have sold their business, a portion of their business or all of it. Um, and private equity is now a partner and they're doing great things there. You talked about you know reinvesting every dollar to grow the business to where it is today. So I would imagine you have private equity knock on your door quite regularly, yet you haven't taken outside money. You preferred to, I guess you would call, you know, say, go it alone and, and continue to reinvest. Talk to me just a little bit about um, the thought process there, and then I'll get into what you would you know, what you would see as a negative to private equity. And then perhaps someday, if you consider private equity, what they might be able to do for you that you couldn't do on your own. Sure. So there's a lot there. I mean, um, but look, private equity absolutely has a place. And, um, and I, and I think that, you know, I've got tons of friends, um, you know, that have, that have done really well bringing on private equity. For me, it's always come down to, you know, you know, coming, uh, coming up with a valuation of the business as it is today. And then uh, earmarking on what you could do with private equity uh, versus what you could do on your own and sort of running those ratios. And, um, you know, because, you know, you bring in a partner institutional capital, they're going to, you know, they're going to likely want control. And if they don't take full control, there's going to be a lot of different things in the contract where they essentially have control, even though you think you do. So I've been, you know, very cognizant of and, and aware of that, uh, that element to bringing on institutional capital. And so for me, it's always been about um, valuation numbers of the business that you have. And then how much fuel are you really putting on the fire? Because if you're maximizing growth um, yourself, I would say continue to do that with as much fuel as you have on your own first um, until such time, either the business is too big or the opportunity window is closing. Uh, where you really got to shoot the gap quickly to get maximum um, growth. Um, that's where private equity, you know, in my opinion, uh, can really come in and and and, and juice you. Uh, so let me right double click on, on that formula for just a sure. sec. So what you're saying is, I'm going to just make up numbers. If I get five million today plus this percentage of of Nuco or or the combined company, versus not getting five today, continue to reinvest, continue to grow. You're comparing what you think the five million plus the smaller piece is versus you continuing to keep a hundred percent at some point out in the future, and the way that you view it in your math, the hundred percent always outweighs the option A. Is that is that what you're saying? Did I express it right? Yeah, until the pie becomes so much bigger that having a smaller piece of it is just worth it, right? Like I'll, I'll give you an example, a buddy of mine, and I won't share names, you know, I keep it confidential, but um, about three, four years ago, um, he's got a, a software business. Um, three, four years ago, he brought on um, uh, some institutional capital, he brought on a private equity group. Um, they gave him a $100 million value for his business three years ago. Here's a company doing 10 or $15 million in recurring revenue on the SaaS side. So they gave him a hundred million bucks. He took 70% uh, off the table, de-risk. So he held on to 30%. So he took $70 million. Now he's under 40, like I am. And $70 million is you never have to work again in your life. But <clears throat> also like me, you know, we're going to leapfrog out of bed. If I was leaping, leapfrogging out of bed, with a dollar to my name, I'm me, I'm going for it with 70 million in my name. I mean, that's just the way we're built. And so for him, he knew that uh, he was in a, he's in the healthcare industry. So he knew that if I could bring on um, the right capital, let me define the right capital. Uh, there's a lot of money out there. There's more money out there now. I think I saw it last check, $17 trillion or something like that. And I had a banker explain to me, you could repave the entire infrastructure of the United States in gold and still not pay a trillion dollars to do that. Okay, well, there's $17 trillion available. 
So it's just incredible. And so if you think about, uh, you know, what that sort of money could do and uh, back to the right money, um, not just money, but um, guidance, uh, true partnership, how they're going to work with you to build out the right team. I remember him telling me he thought he had the best leadership team on the planet. And, and look, these people were great. But what gets you from A to B doesn't always get you from B to C. And uh, pri the private equity firm he partnered with, they were fantastic guys. Not only did they come in with the money and they came in with deeper pockets to the willing to reinvest uh, into the business. This was three years ago. This business is now well over $600 million valuation worth. So when you think about first bite at 70, he held on to 30%. If the business sold today, which it won't because it has too much upside, he's got another 150, 200. So his second bite is twice the size. Um, and his last three years were a lot less stressful than his first seven building the business. Sure. And they brought in, you know, they brought in a lot of uh, educated folks that could say, hey, look, we can quickly get you the right CFO. And, and I don't know the exact, you know, the, the exact right. role, but the, the right COO or the right marketing person or the right uh, CTO or, you know, and, and now rather than being alone at the top, building the business with all your own chips, you've got a true partner at the table that de-risks you considerably because you came on a very healthy valuation, but also is going to give you fuel to grow and go do things. That's awesome. That's home run private equity, you know, just in my opinion, from an entrepreneur standpoint, coming in and, and being awesome. Right. Fortunately, as you know, there's a lot of scenarios that don't work out like that. Yes. And, and so, so we talk a lot on, on this podcast about the second bite, and we've got people that are in the first scenario working towards that second bite. So as opposed to continuing to talk about that, Tell me some of the things that, that concern you most about doing a transaction with private equity and, and, and what's led you to decide to continue to grow on your own. Um, control has a lot to do with it for me. Um, making sure that you have a true seat at the table. I mean, this is, this is this is my business. What I've been doing this is my baby, right? I've, this is the fourth kid, um, yeah. and 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 the first one really, because uh, you know started the business in well the oldest child, having, yes. Well, well, my oldest is five, right? So <clears throat> certainly, um, you know, making sure that and 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 I'm so I think it's important. I'm under forty. Um, I, there's a lot of folks that look at things differently in the stage of life and where they're at. I've got a ton of fuel in the tanks. I think that's a really important piece. Um, I see this business as being able to be, you know, if done the right way, a billion dollar business, truly. And so it, in that sense, if, you know, I'm 37 years old and I'm sitting on a $75 million business, I grew from zero. And um, I think that with the right partner and the right capital, I could turn this into a billion dollar business. Then Control naturally is going to be important to me, right? I sure. I, I have another friend that sold his business and um, didn't go with the business. Um, the number was right, the valuation number was right, but I'll never forget him saying to me, um, "John, I can't imagine." The reason I I opted out is I couldn't imagine raising my kid, uh, uh, or or living in my house and having someone else raise my kid. <laughs> yeah, good analogy. Right, living in my own house and having someone else raise my kid, I just couldn't understand that. So I took the check and I was out. That business is doing great, by the way. It didn't. It had the dynamics in it. He built such a great business. It didn't need him. But um, and and kudos to him for doing that. There's not many businesses that are quite like that. Um, but but I so I I've got I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of folks that I've just been you know when you talk about private equity, it's finding the right partner, and in in many cases, it's well beyond the capital. It's the structure, right? It's making sure that. You know, a lot of these private equity firms, as you know, Todd, they'll, they'll, you know, make sure that there's pref stacks where essentially yeah. their, their shares are worth more than your shares. And that's not, you know, I don't, it, look, I understand the reasoning. I get it. They're putting real money up, up to, to grow the business, but I don't know how fair that is. And so now it's important that, you know, the valuation number was right and they allowed you to de-risk properly. And so all of those things 
um, come into play. And I think a lot of times where I've seen entrepreneurs move too quickly and get involved is, you know, they just see the, they just see the numbers or they see what they can do mm-hmm. and they're not looking at the downside uh, as much. They're getting caught up in the upside. And then, you know, life's not perfect. We might have a COVID-19 happen or a financial crisis. And I mean, look, I've run this business for 16 years. We've seen two massive, and I would argue possibly we're entering three right now with it, anybody who's paying attention to auto. We have a massive inventory shortage uh, with these microprocessor chips where the, the demand has never been higher, but they can't get right. the car out because they don't have the chips. They're essentially the computer inside the car. This mm-hmm. is another crisis that we're heading into. Auto is a very resilient bunch. We'll get through it. However, um, in 16 years, I've seen a massive financial crisis, cash for clunkers and all that craziness. And I've seen a global pandemic. Uh, and so, um, you know, look, had I brought on private equity in either one of those scenarios, uh, I would have tripped covenants and I would have done all sorts of things that would have left me with little to no shares left in my business. And, uh, you know, so I, it, again, there's a lot of dynamics at play, um, but understanding that downside of who you're getting involved with is really, really important. Got it. Let me ask this. I want to get into your strategies for growth in a second, but I think you shared, so the business is about $70 million. Some of that there's media pass through in there, correct? Yeah. It's tough to say. Yeah, Pat, there, there is, there's media dollars involved. Okay. But but your I, I think the point I'm getting to the the you get rid of the pass through stuff and it's still you're in that forty fifty million dollar top line revenue range right. and there's a lot of folks many that I work with that have been in business twelve or fifteen years that to be blunt are not anywhere near that revenue size. Is there anything that you could point to that would explain kind of something that really charged your growth or or ramped you up as to the to the level that you are today um is there anything you could point to there that that would account for that understanding the value that you bring to the client why does the client hire you and probably more importantly why do they fire you and that was really important for us and still is it's I mean, all of our executive leadership conversations and all of their conversations all the way throughout the business are deeply understanding uh, why they're hiring us and the value that we bring to their business. How do they use our technology? What would they like to see out of our technology? They're driving the roadmap. Uh, connectivity to the consumer. We know that if the consumer has a more personalized uh, shopping and buying experience at the store, at the dealership, um, that will create more value for the dealer. And then creating more value for the dealer will create more value for us. And so that has been one thing we've been extremely focused on. So as you think about the last 16 years, when we started the business, less than 10% of a dealership's budget went into digital marketing. Less than 10%. The average dealership spends a million dollars annually in advertising and marketing. Less than 10%. In many cases, less than 5% went into digital marketing. Today, that's north of 60%. So understanding that shift understanding that the best where the best connectivity to the consumer was how to eliminate uh waste that's been one of the cornerstones of our business is eliminating ad waste because if we can it better the communication to the consumer and also grow market share and we can do it for less dollars less cost per unit cpu um, we can take that money and put it to the bottom line uh, for the dealer and that's incredibly uh, important so we've stayed focused on the metrics that work, the metrics that they understand, um, that move their business forward. Um, that's our brand promise to move their business forward. And, um, and we, we, that's been a winning formula for us. Great. So let's talk about growth going forward. I know acquisition, in addition to what you just described, and which would speak to the organic side, you're also thinking about acquisition and i know you've done one acquisition so far can you tell me about that let's start with the acquisition you've done tell me what you can about that but also tell me your biggest takeaway because again a lot of the people that will be listening to this at some point may be sellers 
And it's always hard to view yourself in the eyes of the buyer. Mm-hmm. And since we have a, a potential buyer here, what are the things that you really liked about the acquisition that you did? What are the things that, you, that you're going to be most focused on when it comes to future acquisitions? People. That's easy. I don't care how good your technology is or your access to data, the people behind the scenes are going to be running the business. And so for us, first and foremost, it's who are the people that are driving the business? How connected to the business are they? And what, at what likelihood will we have success blending them into our culture? And that, that is first and foremost. And uh, for us with the acquisition of GSM, this was a 34-year-old business um, that was inside the portfolio of a billionaire family that has been in auto for decades. And uh, it, it started out as their in-house marketing firm for their Toyota dealers. They're the distributor for Toyota in, in the Gulf states. And um, it, 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 you know, it helped uh, by specializing in the fixed ops side of auto, which is parts, service, and accessories. So there's a stat out there in automotive that if you, Todd, buy your car from ABC Toyota and then they earn your first service appointment, just your first service appointment, you are seven times more likely to buy your second car from ABC Toyota. Wow. That's a big number. Big number. So think about a distributorship, right? Very important that they've got really good, uh, we call fixed ops marketing, but marketing that's focused on bringing the consumer in for that first appointment and then all the appointments thereafter, whether it's warranty pay or customer pay or new tires or whatever the scenario might be. And they built incredible technology, incredible processes, great people in the organization. And all they were focused on for the most part has been connect- connectivity to the consumer in and around fixed ops. So for us, we've grown a business on the variable ops side, which was helping dealers sell new and used cars. Right. Every dealer that we have that becomes sort of a great partner dealer, right? Where they're just like, you're bet, you're big, you want all your clients to be that way. Unfortunately, it doesn't always work out that way. But um, when the dealer becomes your best partner, they, they oftentimes just want to figure out how can this company do more for me? And, and the number one question we would get is, how can you help me on the fixed stop side of my business? And we would help, and we would help them from time to time. Anytime we were asked at that, but we didn't, we didn't have tech and solutions at scale. Couldn't bring on a thousand stores tomorrow. Now with the acquisition of GSM, we can. And so- Did you find, I'm sorry, did you go looking for GSM? Did you stumble across them? How did, how did that come about? Yeah. So we've got, you know, definitely have our finger on the pulse of automotive. So as things are moving around, while it's a giant industry, it's actually really small. Networking is something that I enjoy doing. So that is a benefit. I really enjoy networking with different folks and having a lot of conversations, a lot of uh, breakfasts, lunches, and dinners um, that don't have any reason to have the lunch that day, but you just know somewhere down the road, there's going to be a connection point. And I had someone pick up the phone and say, I know that on your road, very, very close friend of mine, uh, I know that on your roadmap is to build or buy a fixed ops marketing platform. And um, word has it, uh, GSM uh, may be up for sale. And so I was very early to the dance. I got to the organization, the owners and the, and the uh, key stakeholders there quickly. You got to think this is during COVID. So no one's in the office. Everything's happening by Zoom. And uh, it was important to me uh, knowing how at the end of the day, we're human beings and we connect with each other in, in a meaningful way when we get face to face. So as well, as much as they advised me not to come to Houston because nobody would be there to meet with me, I said, that's fine, but I'm coming. And if it means I have to take the Zoom call from the parking lot, so be it. <laughs> but I'm going to be in the parking lot. And at wow. the end of the day, even though we had, you know, take your temperature and, and make you sit six feet apart in the conference room and all that good stuff, um, when we talk about it now, th- there was a, we absolutely, uh, took the lead position on being able to acquire this organization because of that move. Um, and so um, that's another key thing. And, and that's the connectivity piece, right? Like how good can you connect with the person? Um, because if you can connect well as people, you have a higher chance of, of being successful in business. 
That's great. Uh, so, and I'm keeping my eye on the clock for us. So I'll keep us sure. on time. Tell me about the roadmap now. When you think about growth, it's interesting because it seems like you've gone, you know, why, as opposed to adding more Toyota, you know, rooftops or or something else, you've gone to to really to solve the customer's problem, your customer's problem. When you think about your roadmap to continuing to solve customer problems and continuing to grow force, what's on the roadmap for next? Well, we've spent a lot of money building out our, our platform. It's a customer data platform, really. It allows us to connect with the dealer's first-party data inside of their DMS, their dealer management system, which is everybody they sold and service a car to in the history of the store. Many of these stores have been around for decades, generations, uh, as well as their CRM, all the net new people that went to their site, filled out a form, cars.com leads, auto autotrader.com leads, uh, you know, whatever. All of the folks that they're sort of mining. Our data platform pulls that all in together, cleans it, normalizes it, and allows us to have one-to-one conversations through digital marketing. So whether that's connectivity into streaming media, whether that's connectivity into Google and Facebook or Bing or um, through uh, different programmatic networks in display and retargeting, um, mail, email, and text marketing, um, we've built out solutions uh, with the focus of creating as many one-to-one conversations as we can and understanding the data really, really well so that we're having timely conversations. There's nothing nothing worse than you go and you buy a car uh, and two weeks later they say, hey, we'd love to get your trade-in. And you're like the trade-in that I just traded in <laughs> two weeks ago. <laughs> right, right. Absolute lame. Yeah. Today's consumer, they're no longer uh, afraid of how much data you have on them. They now expect you have that data on them and they want you to use it properly. No, we don't, you know, if, if, if we're searching for a vehicle and it lands me on a, a, let's figure out what your trade-in is worth. And there's all these forms that I have to fill out. If, they, if you don't pre-populate as much of that form as possible for me, I'm already sort of like ticked off. Right. Agreed. So, you know, that's that expectation piece. So we're focused on businesses that either have tech or data that can drive personalization through an omni-channel world or that have really, really good relationships and what I would call tunnels into dealerships where we can take our well-built technologies and solutions and sell them through that, those channels, sell them through that tunnel. So it's either you're sitting on five or 600 dealership rooftop relationships you have really good close customer retention. They love you, but you haven't really invested on the tech side. You haven't really invested in the programmatic video side, which we're seeing a massive share shift leaving linear TV and radio and going into the stream. It's only natural. We've all done that for the last 18 months while we've been working from home. So that's a massive opportunity. And we've got a drive product that's capitalizing well on helping dealers connect through the stream, uh, both audio and visual. Um, uh, and being able to sell that product into uh, those rooftops um, makes sense. We're kind of thinking about the brand we've built as sort of a state farm model. We've got a great reputation in the business. We've got the big name brand. We've got great technology. We continue to reinvest in data, in tech, so we can better serve the dealer, so they can better serve their hyper-local market pace, their connectivity to the consumers. Um, how can we go and help other Ad, ad groups, ad associations, license that tech, come under if they want to you know, fully buy into what we're doing uh, and be a state farm agent for us. Run your business just like you have, full autonomy. That's one of the things we love about the GSM folks. The entire leadership team stayed on board. Shelly Washburn and Tom Heiser are the two folks running that. Shelly's the president, Tom's executive vice president of sales and operations. And whatever they say, the way that my leadership team looks at it in Atlanta is how can we best support them? They, in, they did not lose a single bit of control of that business by shifting over ownership. In fact, in many cases, they can now fly higher and faster. They have even more support and technology in a company that's constantly reinvesting into what their needs are for their clients. It would um, seem like a great opportunity. I mean, the, the amount of money you've invested in your platform and your technology, can you, can you, Rough that, give me an estimate of what you think that's been over the last two or just the last couple of years. I mean, I, I guess it's significant, correct? Yeah, 21 million, but who's counting, man? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, so you, you <laughs> realize 
the power of that. You realize the expense of that. And there's a lot of guys that I work with that would say, man, if I had access to that, every single one of my customers would be thrilled. We would, right. we would keep them longer. They would spend more. We would do a better job for them. They would love us more. Are, are those kind of the, the, the people you think it, when you think about, you know, growing the agency through acquisition that you're thinking about? That's one bucket. Uh, another bucket might have a really good widget um, that they're applying to a dealer's website that converts at a higher rate. There might be a digital retailing partner out there that says, hey, we can, or, or a financial partner out there that says, hey, we want to, you know, pre-approve everybody and we want to have a, a, a strategic partnership that could lead to, you know, some sort of M&A activity. Um, we're sort of bucketing out the different folks at the different levels, really big or really small. Nothing's off the table. We're looking to scale. Right now, markets are absolutely rewarding scale. Yes. Whether it's private or public. We believe we've built a foundation that can, that can sustain scale, that can um, really be you know, sort of the groundwork necessary to build a, a really big business. And we also believe the timing is right, right? We're coming out of a global pandemic. A lot of people have been humbled up. A lot of people are rethinking sort of the stage of life that they're in and what they're looking for in the next stage. Um, you know, it was a tough time for everybody. And so we believe that coming out of that, mindsets are different. And if we can provide a, you know, a de-risk option where you're part of a bigger family of, we're calling it a family of brands, right? GSM yeah. has had a 34-year incredible run in auto with a great brand name that has a lot of brand equity. Last thing I want to do is buy a business and change the name if, it, if the name has significant equity. And so we have no plans of ever changing the name GSM. We're just calling it part of our family of brands. And we've got a good talk track around how all the brands come together. We've got this concept in our culture called the magic's in the middle. And we absolutely see that. When a dealer is operating within all of our brands, that's where the magic is. That's where they, de that's where they have the biggest opportunity to decrease waste. That's where they have the best connectivity to their consumer. That's where they have the best connectivity to the data. Um, that's where the flywheel happens. Yeah, so we're focused right. in, in, in driving our clients to the middle with all of our brands. And uh, it's, it's working out so far. So if, as you're thinking about you know, M&A, we would be looking for folks that have, again, they're in maybe bucket A, which is great relationships, um, had them for a long time, great client retention, but they're at that point where, hey, look, as we look three, five years into the future, if we don't have best in class technology, and we don't have best in class ability to connect with tomorrow's consumer, we may not be around. The relationship might not have that much to, to keep us around that long. And by partnering with us and coming aboard, now they do and they can continue to run at scale. Uh, or folks that say, hey, we've put a lot into a certain tech piece that we don't have and it makes sense to buy versus build. That would be interesting. And then the last one's the merger side. Uh, again, coming out of a rough year, I think there are a lot of businesses in a very fragmented automotive space. It, auto has been ripe for consolidation, both on the dealer side and the vendor side for a decade. Now's the time. Let's come together. Let's look at what those opportunities might be. If bringing company A and company B is a one plus one equals three or more scenario, I'm all ears and I want to dig in. If it helps the dealer, if it helps the consumer, it'll help the dealer, it'll help us. You know, uh, so I, I love that. My uh, question, pragmatic question. I know how busy you are running the business, how long it took us to get this scheduled, how difficult it is to, it, it, is it okay for somebody just to reach out to you by email? Would that be effective? What's the? They are. So I knew in order to be the best leader I could be at this stage of the business, I needed to go and, and, and build the best executive leadership team I could. So the reality is that I, I have done that over the last few years, and they are phenomenal. They are working in the business so that I can work on the business. So while, yes, I'm busy, I am working on co and having conversations exactly like we're having right now. More you, than I am in the trenches with the dealers. Now, my, the dealers all have my cell phone. They can call me anytime they want. Before this call, I had a five-minute conversation with the CMO at Berkshire Hathaway Automotive. 
They're the fourth largest auto group in the country. They've been one of our best clients for four and a half, five years, actually dating back Berkshire, Warren Buffett, when he wanted to buy into automotive, he bought a company called Van Tile Automotive Group. At the time, they were the largest privately held group. And of course, if Warren's going to get in the game, he's going to buy the biggest that there is. Of course. He bought them. We, we've been working with the group, whether it's Van Tile or Berkshire, 12 years. Uh, but Berkshire's only had a, owned them for about four or five. So um, called me. We had a five-minute conversation, off and running. He's off. I'm off. Everything's good. So don't get me wrong. Um, I have a lot of conversations with clients, and they help me understand what their needs are so that I can best go work on the business. Um, but the day-to-day running the teams, uh, my executive leadership team is doing a phenomenal job of that. That's also sort of helping this thesis, right? You've got to have really good people, really talented people that can think big and execute big. And we have that here. That's one of the values we have. Um, and, and we can help other executives teams level up. Um, if they're going to do that, you have an expectation of how they're going to have their act together from a presentation stamp, presentation standpoint, from a you know, financial integrity standpoint from a financial presentation standpoint and on, correct? That's right. right. Yeah, no, uh, you introduced me to a great group and uh, they, they're awesome guys. And and I don't know if you remember this on one of our last calls, but I said, first and foremost, thank you for operating the way that y'all do because there's no BS. You're, you've anticipated the questions that we're going to have when we look at the financials or we look at the infrastructure of the business. You've jumped ahead. So before we ask them, you're saying, hey, look, this may seem like a, a, a tough spot. And you know what? Hey, it is. And here's how we're handling it. We would much rather have that conversation. We right. know no business is perfect, just like no person is perfect. But let's come open and ready to move and ready to transact. And you've got our attention. Yeah. And it sends a strong signal, I think, to your point when when somebody is buttoned down in the way that, that that particular group was that, that really all of our clients are, because what sellers don't often realize is, you know, that, that first impression is a tough one to overcome. And so if you can set yourself in the position that you want to, in the light that you want to, it makes the entire process dramatically easier. Right. That's right. That's exactly right. And look, I'm, I'm a student of the game too. I will always be learning uh, in, in the acquisition we just did. I'm never going to forget this. The, the head of the family uh, of, of companies there um, told me, hey, John, really interested in what you have to offer as to why we should sell this business to you. Here's my bit of advice. I have two key points. If you stay to those, you might have a shot. Make sure this deal is incredibly simple and clear and make sure you can move incredibly quickly. And if you can do those two things, you got a shot. That's great advice. Great advice. Hey, um, so I got my eye on the clock and we're wrapping up here. So I want to end as I typically do with this question. So you've been very successful. You've been built a, a successful business on top of that. You know, you've got a great family and three kids and, and, and all of that. Thank you. Who did you learn? Who or what did you learn from along the way that made a lasting impact that you could, upon reflection, point back to? Maybe there was a person and or mentor, and maybe there's a book that was super helpful. If you could share that on our way out, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, well, sure. Well, first of all, I got my graduate degree in automotive from my dad. So that's key, right? Uh, He has taught me inside and out every bit that I needed to know to be successful in the auto industry. And it's absolutely why we're as successful as you are is having that institutional knowledge that it took him 30 years to learn. I was able to learn in, in like the first three years of working together. So that was incredibly important. He's, uh, he's number seven of a family of eight. My grandfather, who I'm named after, was very you know influential in many many ways. Uh, in fact, he would come into the office with us and he was uh, you know our first capital partner. Uh, when we first started the business. So that was really, really important. He was really great in that, that aspect and just sort of sharing with us, for my dad too, right? Uh, just great, great knowledge. Um, early on in my career, I don't know if it was college or beyond, um, I was introduced to a book called The Four Agreements. It looks like this. Um, it's so simple. The Four Agreements are really simple. First is be impeccable with your word. And we know how important that is in business. 
Um, the second is don't take any, anything personally. I'll tell you an auto, you, there's some interesting characters in auto and you definitely need to not take anything personally. When, you know, you call the average, the average car dealer is 73 years old. There's 16,654 of them. Um, take out the 1500 that are owned by the publicly traded. So there's 15,000 for 73 year olds. Uh, I've already shared with you my age. I've been building this for 16 years. So think back when we were first building the business, 24 years old, coming in, telling him how to run his business. Hey kid, calm down. All right. You know, <laughs> maybe depending on the part of the country, uh, F off, right. Uh, you got to not take anything personally. Um, don't make assumptions. So important. All too often I have found people make assumptions and it kills them either internal with their, uh, colleagues or with where they sit on a pitch or where they are within a client relationship. They make an assumption rather than really digging in. And then they react off of an assumption and they're dead in the water. And that assumption was wrong. Uh, and always do your best, right? So these are simple, simple things. Be impeccable with your word. Don't take anything personally. Don't make assumptions. Always do your best. Four agreements, guideposts have absolutely helped me uh, all along the way. And then I would say continue to network, um, never know it all, and uh, be a student of the game. Uh, I'm a member in YPO, Young Presidents Organization, and there is countless guys that have given me incredible insight um, into business in general and leadership, uh, that I'm, uh, forever grateful for. Well, we are That's grateful. I yeah. I thank you for that. I am grateful for your time today. I know that you're busy. This is, uh, enlightening and helpful and it gives great perspective to the other side. Um, thank you for sharing as openly as you did continued success, John, along your path. And, uh, thanks again for your time today. Thank you. I appreciate it. It was uh, quite the time. Thanks for listening to the Second Bite Podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.